Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra Gavarucha, and I'm a host of today's webinar, Digital Transformation for Banks. While some attendees are joining us, I'd like to ask you to write your company name or business domain and your role so we could understand better who are here. Please use chat for this. And a few words about myself. I'm responsible for international PR and business development in the UK and Israel at Sigma Software, a company which is holding this webinar. And I'm a co-founder of the biggest startup community in Ukraine, UTEF Tech Tribe. That's why the topic of digitalization business is very close to me. And I'm happy that Sigma Software launched a series of webinars that try such topics. Why are we doing this? Uh, in early April, when everybody realized that the lockdown is not just for a few weeks, we gathered with our team and discussed how we could be closer to partners and clients during this challenging period. We came up with an idea of informal webinars where we could cheer up each other to share knowledge and provide with our tech expertise. That is how Sigma Software, together with business partners and friends from all over the globe, launched a series of webinars for the global tech community in order to overcome these challenges together. Here I should say thank you to our co-organizers and partners, Sigma Software Labs, a platform for boosting startups, Corizoid.com, Datrix AI, the Swedish Bankers Association, the Nordic Reg Tech Association. Thank you guys, your engagement is very appreciated. And now let's jump to the webinar's rules. First, each speaker will have up to five minutes for a short introduction of the topic. Then we will start a live discussion during which you'll be able to participate in polls, tapping on one of the suggested answers. Please be proactive here. If you want to share a comment or discuss some points with other webinars participants, please use the chat button. Afterwards, we will jump to the Q&A session. To ask your question, please tap the button Q&A on the bottom of the Zoom panel and write it down. And we are going to have polls asking you some questions, as I already mentioned. So please tap on one of the suggested answers. Well, this is it, and we are about to start a conversation, and I'm welcoming the moderator of our event, Sergei Danilenko, VP at Middleware Incorporated, North America, Corizoid.com. Sergei has extensive experience as a chief marketing officer of Privat Bank, eighth largest retail bank in Eastern Europe. Now he holds uh, the position of a VP at Middleware Incorporated, that works with Fortune 500 companies worldwide on digital transformation projects. Sergey will reveal his understanding of a truly digital bank and how your bank can become one, and also will drive today's discussion. Sergey, stage is yours. Thank you, Alexander. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, okay, let's start with some introductions. My name is Sergey. I'm responsible indeed for the global business development in middleware company. You can check our website corazoa.com to find out more. And let me introduce our speakers. The speakers are Richard Eriksson. He has a PhD in economics, a senior advisor at the Swedish Bankers Association. He previously worked at Riggs Bank, SNS, the Ministry of Finance of Sweden, and Stockholm University. Richard, will you say a couple of words about yourself as well? Yeah, uh, do you hear me? Do you see me? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, well, I think it was, uh, I don't have much to add to this. Uh, I'm an economist and uh, so I'm not an expert at all in uh, computer science or how to design mobile interfaces, for example, things like that. It's more of uh, how will uh, digital transformation, how will it affect the market, uh, how will it affect banks, how will it affect other players. And I also am from Sweden, so I have a very Swedish perspective in the sense that um, uh, banking in Sweden is to a very large extent already digital. Thank you. 
Thanks, Richard. Uh, guys, everybody in chat, please feel free to share links to your LinkedIn profiles to get to know each other and add to professional connections as well. Uh, let me introduce Hanne Kristinovich, our next speaker. She is FinTech Program Manager at Sigma Software. Hanne focuses on helping financial institutions and FinTech companies move in an efficient way to the digital, to the digital world where we already live. Hanne, will you add anything? Um, maybe a few words very shortly. I have uh, 15 years, last 15 years I spent uh, uh, in the banking uh, industry. Before that was uh, telecommunication and I managed lots of functions such as uh, collection operations, some um, sales activities, uh, digital channels, ma channels management. And last few years, uh, five years, I, I focus on uh, change management. I was the head of project management office and in my portfolio, some complicated uh, changes such as bank merging, digital transformation, and I know how it happened inside the bank. And uh, today I'm going to share some thoughts about that. Thank you, Sergei. Sure. Um Okay, uh, let's move according to our agenda. Uh, as a moderator, I, will, I would like to share my screen and do some kickoff slides. Uh, they will be a little bit provocative. Uh, I will do that on purpose for our speakers to be able um, to explain, to share the thoughts of how the things could be done actually right. Uh, so let me share my screen now. Uh, this is the presentation and some slides that I was preparing recently for one of the co conferences and I started my speech with explaining what common mistakes do people do when they start digital transformation projects. Uh, personally me, I do a lot of meetings and calls, approximately 100 meetings per month. So I see how different banks in various regions in Europe and Middle East in the United States approach the process of digital transformation. And uh, when I started preparing for this conference, uh, at the same day, a guy reached out to me. His name is George Morrison. He was working for PayPal previously. And I noticed that he has these words, digital transformation, right here as a part of his title. So he says he's a specialist in digital transformation. And I started searching in LinkedIn. I, I wanted to know how many people with these words are there in, in the title. So LinkedIn says that we have approximately 1 million 100,000 people with a professional title saying digital transformation. One million people who are experts in digital transformation, but where is everybody? Where is one million digitally transformated companies? I started digging deeper and I went to Google to search for Google Trends. I wanted to know when actually the term digital transformation started to take off. I found out that it happened around 2013. And at this point, my boss, my, uh, the CEO and founder of Middleware Company, he asked this question, what happened in 2013? Why everybody started looking for digital transformation? One of the reasons for that is that in 2013, we had the event when the first time in the world, one billion smartphones were sold. So banks obviously needed to react. That was the tipping point where banks understood that the world changed and you actually need to go mobile, you need to have in place the necessary API infrastructure, microservices infrastructure. Somebody needs to be really prepared for this digital world because we are not tied to branches anymore. We are not tied to the desktops. Everybody is going mobile. So a lot of banks just started doing digital transformation. But a funny thing happened. A lot of banks started behaving like these people in cargo cults. Uh, perhaps you remember this part of, of the history when during the Second World War there were planes flying uh, over some countries and uh, uh, they were distributing food and other useful stuff among military personnel and uh, some uh, people, local people, uh, they said that they need to do some rituals uh, to keep uh, receiving that food and uh, cool, uh, cool stuff from those planes. Uh, flying. So they just mocked up these planes and starting like dancing and pretending uh, that they do something, uh, they do something useful. Uh, the thing we started seeing in our world, in the world of digital transformation in banking, I would like to share some examples. This is an example from the neighbor country. 
uh, Sberbank in Russia, they spent almost $6 million on the project with McKinsey. The project was called Agile Home. So they started thinking that digital information is about going agile. In the end, they have beautiful signs, Agile Home right here in the lobby. And uh, it's like, here we go. We are now digital. We have the signs, we have smoothies, we have startup guys in hoodies and t-shirts. Let's call it digital transformation like moving from one office to the fancy office with, with these signs and letters. Another way to approach this was the following. Some companies, some banks, they started thinking, okay, we do digital transformation. What does the IT company have uh, in common with uh, cool digital companies? They have developers. Let's hire a lot of developers. And they did. JP Morgan Chase hired 30,000 developers. Sberbank hired 22,000 developers. Looking at these figures, we might think that both Google and Apple are just losers because they have less developers than those banks. But those banks did not create anything like Google Storage or Apple iPhone, nothing like that. So we cannot obviously solve digital transformation issues with just hiring more people to the team. It makes things only more difficult. At the same time, some companies, they started investing money in IT. The IT budget skyrocketed uh, we know personally the company that says they have one billion dollars IT budget per year. So the, this figure seems huge, but uh, the research says that only uh, seventy percent of uh, this, uh, sorry, so, uh, approximately thirty-five percent of this amount of money goes actually to innovation. Approximately seventy percent, and there is another research saying eighty percent of IT budget goes on the maintenance. They just keep paying DevOps and are the guys to support server infrastructure and they're not moving anywhere. Uh, obviously, you can't approach in innovation and transformation in this way when you uh, spend that much, much, much money only on uh, maintenance. More retails. Uh, some banks said, let's do startup contest. Let's announce the contest, let's uh, give some prizes and let's hope that startups from external world will bring some ideas and then perhaps will be able to incorporate those ideas into our reality. It's always failed. I did not see any single startup who actually took part in such a contest and uh, successfully um, transformed into something big inside the bank. That's a separate conversation. Why could that happen? But that's it. Some banks said, let's open digital hub, digital lab, digital uh, whatever, uh, hub lab, uh, some place uh, and let's say those guys are responsible for digital. Um, uh, we have a friend, Chris Skinner, who lives in London and who is the author of the book, Digital Bank. He is also blogging about digital banking and he, he has this joke. If you have a digital chief digital officer in that, in, inside the company, CDTO, you might have a problem because everybody starts thinking that that's a guy's job to do digital. Everybody can rest. Business tourism. Uh, we met a lot of banks who just keep attending conferences for some reason. Uh, we see uh, the names in the list of speakers everywhere. Uh, they spend the money and creative energy and ideas into something like this, like you see on the right hand. This is some innovation ag or whatever is that. Uh, the guy is doing their dancing. So they just uh, constantly speaking, talking, exchanging slides, etc. definitely does not lead uh, to any significant changes. Uh, another thing that you know well from your banking is RFPs. You absolutely cannot innovate, but just announcing the RFP. It usually takes years. For the first year, you collect these requests for proposals, then you develop something, then there is implementation, and you end up with all these legacy software with siloed pieces of software distributed all across the organization. Another thing is, uh, let's just buy a magic pill. Let's say SAP or any other major vendors announce they have a super cool new stuff. You buy it and your problems will be solved. That's, they say, state of the art, the recent development, just invest in that, integrate, and that's it. Uh, very few companies understand that it's not working that way. You can invest whatever money you, you think relevant. Right here, you see on the, web, on the slide, 500 million invested by Lidl, uh, in SAP and it just failed. It's not about the money in the end. Uh, you cannot buy something and uh, stop worrying about going digital. Digital transformation is a process. It's a process where all the stakeholders are involved. Uh, it's not the one-time 
action or decision. It's the constant, constant movement into the right direction. So that was the introduction, the question to our speakers, what shall we do? Uh, what can be possibly done in this situation? Um, and uh, I will welcome our first speaker, Richard Erickson. Also, we collect questions from the audience. Please type the questions in chat or participate in our polls. Uh, we'll ask those questions in the end. Thank you. Richard, please, the floor is yours. So, just uh, maybe take one step back and think about some innovations are changing an industry completely. Uh, other innovations uh, can be very useful, very valuable, but doesn't transform an industry. Like, for example, an airbag. That is a very useful thing. It saves a lot of lives, but it has not transformed the car industry. The same, the same maker cars are still around before and after the airbag, but it still it's an excellent innovation. And um, I think you can think about innovation in the banking industry about a bit like that also. The banking industry has digitalized to a very large extent as um, well, I'm from Sweden and uh, it's um, the payments industry is all almost uh, completely digital. It's very uncommon to pay with cash. It's um, very easy to do all your, um, say, ordinary business uh, on over the internet. It's very seldom you go to a bank office and so on. So to a large extent, the banking industry in Sweden are more or less digital, but of course there are still a lot and lot and lot of things you can do better. You can move it smoother, cheaper and so on. But um, I think um, that the core thing about the bank, the very core uh, that has been around for hundreds of years, it's bank accounts. So if you have a bank account, why is that good? The alternative to a bank account is to have cash. And uh, a, few, a few hundred years ago, when people started using bank accounts, there, the reason for that was two. That one reason was that if you had coins, gold coins, for example, people could take a little bit, little bit of gold from the coin. And if you do that on a lot of coins, you get a lot of gold. So you had to check your coins, say, is this a valid coin? Is this a coin that is good enough? If you instead set, uh, store all your coins at a bank, in a bank account, and you, I say that uh, I transfer uh, five coins to Hanna, from my account to Hanna's account, then we don't need to check the coins. And the other thing is, of course, uh, safety. And there you have two, you have a trade-off. If you have cash, you can be robbed, you can, uh, uh, misplace your cash. In Sweden, there are a lot of um, you find a lot of cash from um, the Middle Ages that the Vikings had when they buried in the ground, and then they forgot where they had buried it. So now we find a lot of coins from uh, like uh, uh, thousand-year-old coins uh, in uh, former Viking villages, but. Um, on the other hand, if you have a bank in a bank account, that could also be risky. A long time ago, the, maybe the biggest risk was that the king or the government just would seize the bank, money in the bank. And of course, you have the risk of uh, theft and so on. But uh, you also have the risk that the bank is not safe enough in the sense that they cannot repay you. You might have a very good wall, it, it can be you, your money are very physical safe, but uh, if the banker, for example, extend a lot of loans to his friends and his friends um, make a lot of bad investments and can't repay the loans, then you can't uh, get your money out of the bank. And that is the other thing that is uh, a risk. That is the reason that banks 
are regulated uh, and that the banks have to have a lot of capital themselves. So they have a buffer if they lose some money, then it's still, uh, it should still be able to repay their bank account holders. And a bank account, so it can be used for saving money and it can be used for uh, sa saving, storing money and for making transfers when you buy or sell stuff. But then you put all the money in the bank and when there are a lot of money in the bank, then you can make money as a bank if you lend it out to someone and you get interest on it. And for that reason, bank accounts and lending, that is an activity that fits together. And uh, that was true 200 years ago when the modern banking was born. And it, I think it's still true. And if you make all these uh, things with bank accounts and lending and getting interest and so on digitally, or if you uh, go and get your, have a check or whatever, I mean, it's different technology. It's a lot, a lot what has happened and it will change a lot for people. But the, the basic banking, the core banking idea, I think um, it's still uh, there. And I think it will be around uh, when all this digital transformation has taken place. Thank you. Thank you, Ricard. Thanks for sharing the thoughts. Uh, let's give the floor to Hanna before we proceed to questions. Please, Hanna, go ahead. Okay, I, I will uh, focus my uh, presentation. I have some slides and uh, uh, I would appreciate uh, if, uh, um, Richard, could you please give me the host right? I, I can share the. So uh, my, uh, uh, my spe speech will be a little bit more about internal um, side uh, uh, that uh, uh, changes which uh, uh, need to be happened in the organization in the bank for to to transform uh, itself. So um, for to uh, do the same business, but uh, a little bit more not a little bit, but more efficient and more digital way. So um, I start with the. Uh, slide and actually here's uh, uh, the keywords uh, um, for digital transformation. For me, uh, digital transformation is first of all about the focus on, on the client and that is uh, uh, actually a big change in, in mind, mindset which uh, uh, should uh, um, actually Everyone should come to that, but still in the banks, uh, lots of people think uh, um, we are the product logic or I don't know, uh, some process logic, but the main should be the client. Uh, the second one is time to market and time to market. It is about the metabolism of the organization. That is the speed, how the company, the bank can react the external or maybe internal challenges such as uh, i don't know uh, client needs or competitive uh, activities competitors activities or it can be regulatory requirements uh, so uh, the organization should react uh, very fast if uh, the reaction is one or two years that is not uh, a digital company and that is one of the criteria who who, who can be named as, as um, digital. And the last one is online, and that is something must have. Um, that is uh, also about the speed and uh, online uh, influence a lot if client stays with you or choose you or choose another company, uh, another bank. Uh, so next uh, is, uh, next thing is second, next one is, um, uh, some thoughts about the digital transformation. Very often, as Sergey has already mentioned, that uh, this kind of uh, transformation uh, is very often about technology, and uh, it's it's obvious that buying new system uh, will not help to to transform or to change significantly uh, the organization and the way the organization do business. Uh, does business. 
So I believe that to really transform the bank, it is very important to think not only about the technology, but also people and process. Um, actually, transformation should happen with all these uh, three bubbles. And I will um, give the example, even not an example, but um, I will use metaphor to, to show you that. Um, I have a hobby and my hobby is uh, triathlon. Um, that is um, the sports. You should swim there, uh, ride a bike and also run. So also uh, you may know that uh, as Ironman, it is a long distance race. Uh, the maximum is uh, uh, four kilometers to swim, then ride a bike something like 200 kilometers and at the end you should do marathon. So it takes 12 or 14 hours to, to deal with that, to, to finish this race and to prepare yourself for that you need at least two or three years. So it is kind of transformation, um, kind of personal transformation. Lots of things changing when you do that and that uh, looks uh, uh, similar uh, a little bit uh, uh, what uh, should happen in the organization when, when organization decide to go in such uh, huge changes. So to proceed with the first bubble, the people, I want to pay attention to the starting point. And starting point is very, very important, uh, uh, both for triathlon and the same for the business. And it can be the case that at the very beginning, when you decide to go so, to a such complicated thing, uh, you didn't do any sports, your food is not healthy, and you have lots of extra kilos. And definitely you are not able to run marathon or do something uh, or, or do Ironman very fast. So you need time and you need some special preparation for that, taking into consideration the, the sets, that starting point. The same with the bank. If uh, on the starting point you, I don't know, have, uh, if you as organization, as a bank, you buy and uh, let's say eat uh, lots of system softwares and you have lots of them, you have lots of extra kilograms of such a software, it creates a big complexity to run a marathon. <laughs> the same with the processes, the processes uh, for the many years of uh, for, for the history of the bank, they can become so complicated with so many controls. So it's uh, uh, really uh, very difficult even to touch, to touch, to try them to change. So that extra kilogram somehow sh you should do with, deal with that and that is not very fast and we should remember that the way you do that is very specific and should fit to the organization. It's not possible just copy past that from, I don't know, from some other part, from uh, other company. So then people, uh, why it is important the starting point, because to proceed, uh, you should understand that at any case, that will be painful. Such kind of changes, such kind of transformation is always painful. Why it is painful? Because it is highly uh, about, it's, um, it's about the uh, very deep changes. Uh, that changes is about, uh, I don't know, people should change the mindset, uh, their approach uh, uh, to do some changes in the organization, the way they communicate, the way they um, understand uh, client needs, uh, etc. And that changes uh, is very, very painful. And for to do that, uh, organization, the bank, the management should uh, definitely care about the people and support them during this uh, such a complicated, uh, um, uh, such a challenge for, for, for them. Uh, the next one is processes. That's a screens. Uh, it's a, a very interesting that uh, after I start doing uh, triathlon, I start care about, uh, for example, how many hours I sleep, that the screens from Garmin, the computer, uh, which tracking the number of uh, um, hours of sleeping and also heart rate. Uh, I, I start to track that. Uh, also, I start to track, uh, uh, I had to start to do that, how many calories I eat, what did I eat, how many I burned, etc. So, uh, 
my question, I never did that before. And the question was why I start do that, uh, why I, I need that. At end the end, uh, the answer is um, uh, that activities uh, support the goal I have. If I do not care about how many hours I sleep, I will not have enough um, energy to uh, prepare myself for such a challenging uh, goal. Uh, the same with the organization. Uh, it's not a good idea to use old uh, processes uh, doing uh, something new. You definitely need to change the approach. If you want to uh, do innovation or some experiment, it will be strange if you spend two years to, to make some experiments. It will cost you a lot to, to, to do such experiments. You definitely should change the process and find the way to check, to check the ideas very fast, to get a very fast feedback from the market if you are going right way or this way is not, uh, is not good. Uh, and that is a big challenge uh, for, for many of, of the bank with, uh, with the history. And the last, uh, uh, and the last actually is uh, technology. And that bike uh, cost uh, something like $20,000. And uh, it's not very easy to manage this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, stuff. And uh, from one point uh, of view, it is something that everyone wants to have. But from another point of view, if uh, your mindset and your body is not ready for the race, that kind of device will not help you. Uh, actually, it can even make worse, create some complexity for you. So uh, this is the one point. And the second is that your, if your mindset is ready, if your body is ready, this technology can give you a few additional seconds to win, to uh, beat your competitors, to be the best. So um, once again, just to finish my, my speech, once again, it is very important uh, to remember about all three components. And that, uh, from my point of view, that is something which can be named as true digital uh, transformation. Thank you, Sergei. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing the thoughts. Let's jump to Q&A then. I don't know if we can take all the questions, but let's start taking one by one. Uh, so the question from George Javcock. Uh, nice to see you, George, here. Uh, so George is asking the following question. In the banking, has Gartner's B-model approach been helpful or a hindrance to digital transformation implementation. Uh, just to remind what is the Gartner B model approach, uh, I will share the screen. Uh, yeah, Hannah, could you be right back? Okay, done. So the Gartner has this uh, definition for B model IT. Gartner is saying it's the practice of managing to separate coherent modes of IT delivery. You have one people focus on stability and other on agility. Mode one is traditional and sequential, emphasizing safety and accuracy. And mode two is exploratory and nonlinear, emphasizing agility and speed. Uh, going back to the question, so is it actually helpful or a hindrance to digital transformation? I guess there is some uh, very uh, um, efficient uh, examples. Uh, I know, Sergey, maybe uh, the bank you worked before is something like that uh, uh, when there was two, two separate uh, IT with agility and uh, the second one focused on the stability. For, for my, and maybe Sergey will comment that, but from my point of view, it uh, sounds like a um, uh, good approach uh, because very often people who can create some innovation, uh, for them it's very difficult to care about uh, um, security and stability, uh, mentally very difficult. Uh, of course, it's important uh, uh, very much important how to manage that uh, and uh, that 
definitely will have some conflict, but uh, I know, know some cases and that 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 was a uh, good approach. Sergey, maybe you say something. Uh, well, I suggest Ricard, uh, would you like to share your thoughts here? Is the model approach yeah. good? Well, I'm an economist and not a data scientist. I frankly have no idea. Uh, what do economists think about agility and speed versus safety? Well, I don't think economists think so much about that, but maybe just if you, if you want me to speculate, uh, I, I've been thinking a bit about this um, Facebook the, the, when they introduced this Libra project. And uh, if you are from the banking industry, you could be uh, amazed that, okay, they are introducing accounts and uh, a new currency, and they will be able to pay with these accounts. Uh, but wait, what about uh, terror financing? What about uh, uh, anti-money laundering? What about uh, safety of the deposits and so on? Well, it's bank. Then you have to have all this bank regulation. You, can, you can't do that. It's uh, just... Uh, and then I thought about uh, this, uh, you know, Facebook previous mantra, move fast and break things. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is a way of working that moves that, that works very well in some industries but uh, maybe not in the banking industry uh, so i don't know if that has anything to do at all with the uh, gartner's bimodal model but um, that's some speculation anyway okay uh, thanks Richard. Uh, well uh, i answer briefly i uh, used to work in a private bank where we had a center of electronic business where almost all the innovations, world-class innovations, were born with dozens of patents. Some of the things were invented for the first time in the world, like share credit card, for example, invention by Alexander Vitas, the founder and CEO of our company, the technology that allows sharing access to credit and debit cards instead of doing a money transfer. We're also the first team in the world that opened our APIs in 2010 that is still a lot of banks in Europe are struggling to do to approach these European PSD2 uh, requirements. Um, I think uh, we can talk here about some uh, secret sauce. You need to be really curious. You need to be driven by curiosity. Well, that's the idea of, of, of Alexander Ritesh. Uh, if you are curious, uh, nobody can stop you. If you are not, then you talk about uh, safety and regulation and compliance and all other things. It's, I think it's a matter of character. Anyway, George, I think we'll have an opportunity to discuss this separately. Let's, let's move ahead. I think this question goes to you, Rickard. Uh, so uh, how do you manage the compliance and regulatory requirements from multiple jurisdictions? The due diligence and reporting requirements make it difficult to digitize across the bank. Well, I guess, um, of course, that is a problem with, uh, uh, with um, regulations dif being different in different countries. And if you go into, say, the Swedish mortgage market and, uh, say, the Norwegian mortgage market, that are quite similar in many aspects. But if you go deep in it, there are a lot of differences between all countries. Uh, in the way things do, how the legal framework works, and that can make a lot of differences. So it's unfortunately a part of life and uh, it's nothing to uh, enjoy, but that, that it's the way it is. I mean, uh, it would be perfect if you could have the same laws and regulation in all countries in the sense that it would be simpler to uh, do the digital solutions, but uh, it's simply not the case. I mean, you, you have to deal it with it, you have to solve it. Okay, thank you, Ricard. Uh, the question from Hamid Hassan. Is there common different strategies to start banking digital transformation? What are those? Uh, Hannah, I suggest you answer these. Where do we start? 
I don't know, I, I guess um, any, if it is really transformation, transformation means something uh, kind of very deep changes. Uh, to do that, uh, the starting, uh, the first step is always uh, to, uh, to real, um, to, to, to take that decision uh, and be very honest in the decision. And I mean, that such kind of things, from my point of view, always starts from the sale of the bank. Uh, if the first person who really influence uh, and really care about the future of the bank decide that, uh, not just uh, blah, blah, but decide that, then uh, that is the first step. And uh, all other, all, all following steps will highly depends, as I mentioned, from, uh, on, of the starting point. For some uh, banks, uh, I don't know, that process can be not so painful and uh, they did some preparations before and that can be more, more let's say, technological technology related changes in in some organization uh, first is uh, to, to to start with the people and uh, the processes so uh, it's uh, but at any case the first step is sale decision uh, and very often uh, such uh, transformation is not successful because they, that the main person in the bank is not sure about uh, it's, it's not really want such kind of uh, changes. Actually, it is the same as, as, as with the sports. I know lots of people are running marathon and it's uh, obvious that training process can be different for each person. But the main thing is the decision to do that and the goal, to, the goal set to do that. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, I would agree with Hannah. Uh, from what I see, uh, successful projects are those projects when you have CEO as investor in change. In some cases, it's good to have energetic, charismatic product owners. The person that says, I need this, I want to do this, I will invest my energy, this is my career, I want to go something. Then you can start actually with, from dealing with such a person and then engage CEO at some point in the end. Okay, let's talk about talents a little bit. Um, the question is the following. Uh, a lot of young people think that the bank is just a boring place to be working for. Do, the question is, do you agree or not? How that could be changed? How banks can compete and win the battle for the best engineering talent against Google? Google offers cool bicycles, PlayStation, free beer in the canteen. How you can attract the best engineers to be working on digital transformation inside the banks? Rickard, will you take this one? Uh, well, uh, I guess maybe it was worse a few years ago when uh, Google and Facebook and so on was really, really cool. Now, I mean, maybe it's not, maybe it's changing a bit. And, um, but of course, I mean, some places are cool to work with. And uh, say, uh, if you work at Google and uh, are really into making all these complex algorithms, uh, it's uh, sure great fun. But uh, I guess you can, uh, I mean, the banks are also very big uh, IT organizations do important stuff, complicated stuff, and so on. So I think um, uh, if you want to work for, for a big, um, important, uh, and challenging, challenging uh, organization. I mean, a uh, bank could could be it. I mean, it's up up, up to everyone. But maybe if I would were to make some um, uh, make a little bit of a commercial for banks, I would say that uh, bank has been banks has been around for two hundred years and probably will be around for two hundred years or more. And uh, they will be digital, of course, now. So work as uh, work at a bank with the digital um, transformation uh, or digital development. I mean, it's quite a sure bet. I don't know if that is the thing that um, attract all young people, but maybe some. I can see a lot of people from Sweden actually in our webinar. Would you comment 
why would it be cool idea to go and work for Swedish Bankers Association? <laughs> Was that a question for me or for the audience? Uh, for you, Ricard, as representative. Okay. Uh, the, well, the Bankers Association, that is just an association for banks. So we work with, uh, partly with lobbying against politicians and so on, and partly with um, uh, common infrastructure projects. And uh, the common infrastructure projects, I would say, if you are uh, into digital transformation, then I would say it, was be, it is very cool to work for the Swedish Banking Association because the infrastructure, they say that when you move money between banks, or if you have some, I mean, if you have a bank, it's a, you can move money easily within the bank, but you can also move money between the banks, and you have all kind of business transaction between banks. And some of these uh, transactions are, uh, the banks cooperate, cooperate and uh, in uh, projects or, uh, in co-owned companies in order to make an infrastructure where, where everyone can uh, join. So, and that, so if you want to be a part, a part of the early big infrastructure changes, uh, I think the infrastructure department at the Swedish Bankers Association is a really interested place to work because then there are projects going on that uh, have the CEOs of the banks, uh, they, they uh, they are committed to those projects and so on. So that could be cool, but you don't get to do any programming yourself. You have, that will be the banks. So then you are more of like a project leader. Okay, thanks, Ricard. Uh, Ricard is on LinkedIn. So everybody who wants to try working for Swedish Bankers Association, I think you can reach out to Ricard. Uh, great, uh, Hannah, I think the next question goes to you. Uh, I type it in chat, the question from George. Uh, how can banks move from project to product mentality? Or is that not important to digital transformation journeys? I remember that Hannah was the head of the project office in a big retail bank with 4 million customers. When I first met Hannah, she showed like the list of, I think there were 39 projects. Yeah, yeah something like this, yes. Yeah, and we had a lot of discussion. Yeah, please, Anna, go ahead. It's, it's a very interesting question because uh, I have such an experience when we uh, uh, did this um, transfer from project approach to the product ownership approach. Uh, I can actually be uh, in, in the bank I work in, uh, we leave both, uh, we have both schemas, we used uh, project and also um, that uh, uh, we start to um, uh, deal with the product ownership and uh, to grow this uh, product mentality. And I can tell you that that was one of the biggest challenge because product owner uh, in the bank very often, very often is the person who just, um, how to say, just uh, uh, create the pricing of the product and nothing else. And we have to grow such kind of people uh, to the person who is responsible for the product uh, strategy, product design, product PNL, etc. Um, we created some product teams uh, uh, in, in cross-functional teams. There was also a business and also some IT guys, uh, and that. That was really very complicated changes, but at the end, it gave uh, us a very good result. And um, I, I really believe that it's a good idea to, to do like that, um, no matter that that is painful, but at the end, you have very adult people in the team who are able uh, to manage uh, the product as, uh, let's say, separate entity, as a really something which gives, uh, uh, um, helps the organization to earn money. So that's my thoughts about that. Uh, 
Сергей, я вас вижу. Я вас вижу. Perhaps the next question also goes to you. Uh, I mentioned Lidl in my presentation, who made they stack on um, SAP as the backbone on the digital transformation. From your experience working with major vendors globally, uh, what are the positives and negatives of working with um, huge ERP vendors? Shall you rely on them as the basis of digital transformation? Um, you know, it's uh, more about um, um, huge vendors is uh, very often about some very, very long projects for years with very, very, um, um, it's difficult to understand uh, what will be at the end. The risks are very high. The environment uh, is changing so fast. So I can say that I'm not a fan of uh, such kind of uh, big, huge, uh, monster projects. I believe uh, that uh, um, when you talk about digital, the main thing you need to do is, uh, is change your IT architecture and infrastructure such way uh, that help you to make uh, experiments because uh, when you deal uh, with a client these days uh, the changes are so fast and uh, you should check uh, before invest huge money you need to check if this idea is really uh, is something what the client your client uh, need i can i can give you example um, when when uh, we start some digital uh, uh, when we start first digital steps uh, we had a huge number of projects as sergey mentioned and inside each of that project there was um, business requirements and then we uh, uh, we took some pilots, some of these ideas, and try to, uh, uh, using the tool, uh, try to check uh, that ideas which was inside that business requirements. And almost all of them failed. We did some pilots and all of them failed. And just imagine if we do uh, all that project, we spent two years and only in in two years, we understand that all this stuff is not working. And that change, uh, change a lot the approach to, to um, the approach to the vendors, to projects, uh, uh, the way we take a decision about uh, uh, investments, etc. And um, I guess that's all I want to say about that. Uh, yeah, actually, I quite agree with uh, Hannah and uh, sometimes our founder, Alexander Vitas, he, he jokes that uh, huge vendors and also consultants are like historians. They look to the past, yes. they write down what worked in the past, then summarize this experience and then either give you consultancy based on what happened a couple of years ago and what worked a couple of years ago. Or if you're a vendor, then you actually try to implement this into a project. So if you see some platform from big vendor that is presented in 2012, uh, 20, like these days, this means they started thinking about this somewhere in 2015 at best. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, Richard, I think uh, this question goes to you. Uh, from Bjorn Carl Carson. Um, in the digital finance world, when banks make big loans to companies or consumers, how can you control that all this digital money actually is corresponding to some physical value in the real world? And it's not just a digital money printer. Mm -hmm. This question uh, is maybe basic economics because um, Bjorn says he is a civil engineer, uh, but anyway, that's interesting. How do you make sure that digital money exists? 
Yeah, actually, it's it's a very fundamental and uh, mind-blowing question almost. I mean, what is money? And uh, uh, soon maybe cash will be all gone and all money will be digital and they have no physical uh, existence whatsoever. And I would say money is uh, a claim <laughs> that something you believe in has a value. It's like... Uh, in that sense, it's like, um, I mean, it doesn't have any inherent value. It has, the, money has the value that we all believe it has. So it's, uh, and uh, that has uh, more or less, maybe not when they had gold money, but uh, more or less always been the case. And uh, it's um, something that the central bank by in increasing or decreasing the interest rate, they can control the, the price of money and the value of money, uh, but it's it's in one sense it's very simple, but it's really really hard to grasp. I think. I mean, I, I spent uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand it. But it's it's a fascinating subject. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Maybe that wasn't an answer. I don't know. <laughs> uh. Oh, that's that, that's hard to answer in a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe if you think of any books or recommended literature on the subjects, uh, please just share your thoughts in chat. Our listeners could share uh, could could go for that. Uh, and I uh, I want to also ask uh, the next question to you as well uh, about the skill set. Um, let's talk about the skill set needed uh, to be an economist, since you are an economist. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the skill set? W what is your advice? Do you need an MBA or are there any startups uh, in this field? Uh, what should you do? I would say still uh, uh, it's very much uh, if you want to work in the banking industry, there are people who work their way up without an education and so on. But I would say that uh, if you want to have um, a more um, uh, high level job or being a specialist of some kind, then you need some, uh, some degree. Absolutely. It's still, uh, that is the most common thing. It, it's always a good investment, I would say, to get a business degree. Okay, okay. Hannah. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Ricard. Uh, what is your thought? What skill set is, you, is needed these days? Should you learn Coursera courses? or do a startup, or do an MBA? Um, that, um, okay. MBA is always very good for strategy thinking. I guess uh, uh, on some point of time, it can be a good idea to, to have it. Um, I guess it's also uh, very important to at least to try uh, to have knowledges, uh, cross-functional knowledges. Uh, when I did uh, some digital transformation, it was a big um, kind of surprise for me, but still uh, it is the case that uh, when business people, the, I mean the people from business team, start um, think more and uh, um, study some things about IT, they just understand, let's say they, they understood what is API. And uh, in some time, I can say they, all of them became API thinking people. And at the same time, IT team understood some uh, stuff about the business. And that cross-functional um, think uh, make the changes uh, much more faster it added some speed. And I can advise uh, not just focus on some domain, but try to be open for the knowledges from other uh, domains. And, and the, the, I guess now we live in the world where everything is mixed. Uh, and uh, it's very good if you're open and enough flex flexible to deal with these uh, knowledges from different spheres. It helps a lot, uh, I believe so. 
Uh, I just must say I really agree. I mean, that is a very good point that uh, if you are an engineer, try to, when you start working, try to pick up what is the economic value of this and so on. And if you are in, in the business part, of course, it, it's an excellent idea to understand the basics of APIs, for example. I mean, it's, it's very valuable. Uh, maybe not something you learn in school, but when you are out there working, just try to get everything from everywhere and then it's it's very helpful very good advice yep yeah thanks Connor. thanks record uh let's talk about modern digital banks uh are any banks that you admire any features particular features that you admire regard will you comment well, I work for the Swedish Bankers Association, that all the Swedish banks are members. So I will maybe not, uh, well, I, I prefer not to, to answer that question, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. But um, maybe without uh, naming the names. Uh, yeah, but I, think, I think you can say that uh, there are different kind of banks. There are big universal banks, there are niche banks and so on. And I think if you, you find something where what you where you are good then uh, and uh, you have this universal bank that I talked about before with banks accounts and loans and so on a classical bank but of course there are some other banks that specialize in small niches and so on and can be quite successful in those niches maybe they cannot do huge but they can be uh, successful still in their niche so it's um, yeah, that's. That was the last time that you took your smartphone and you were thinking like, "Wow, that's a cool feature." Uh, maybe three months ago. <laughs> what was that? Uh, in banking, also that was um, in Sweden. They have we have when you want to pay someone uh -huh. who has a bank account, then mm -hmm. all bank accounts in Sweden are connected mm -hmm. to Swish. And then you can, if I know the phone number of you, I can uh, take your phone number, swish 100 crowns to you. And that is very much used for small payments. And the mm -hmm. fee that has been around for a few years, but the feature I really like was that you can, when you have sent this, you can you get the picture that you can um, play a little, like, like a piano. Mm -hmm. And I think that is maybe just something cool that people like to play around with, but it's also a way to make it hard to counterfeit a Swiss payment because you could take a print screen and says, oh, I have paid 100. You can see this on my Swiss account. And then I could point at it and say, oh, it's, this is just a, a print screen because I can't make this melody. So that was a cool, cool feature. It sounds like they are adding some emotions to banking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think uh, is the place of emotions in banking? Well, you know, I'm, I'm an economist into numbers and money and the emotions, maybe not the, my strongest side, but of course, if people do things because they like to do it and uh, yeah. Okay, Hannah, what do you think? What features do you admire? Uh, I use this, the Ukrainian Neo Bank, and which is uh, totally digital. And uh, for me, uh, the speed uh, is very important. And when I use that application, it's a definite. I, I, I feel that someone cares about me. I do not need to do a huge number of clicks. And uh, what uh, impressed me a lot uh, before, you know, that once a month I pay some um, bills for the gas, water, etc. And it was a very painful process for me because before I spent a few hours to do that. And uh, we are different channels, uh, etc. So it was a nightmare. But then I start to use a service in this Neo Bank, and I was surprised that I, each time, each time I do that, I spend something like three minutes, and it is something unbelievable. Each time 
I calculate how many hours I can spend for something else, not for, for, for such a, a very, I don't know, not interesting work. So, and also there is some kind of emotions. It's always, it's very often send me some nominations. I don't know, I'm one of, uh, um, I don't know, the best, one of, um, how to say, the person who spend a lot or are doing some traveling, so they kind of not nominating me for, for such activities. So I believe that uh, the speed and emotions is very important. It, that is something which help to onboard clients and uh, to um, and and that is the reason why clients stay with the bank. Uh, it's my thoughts. And here we come to the question about the role of the branches. If you have cats and dogs and badgers and achievements and fun and emotions, do you think the banks need branches? Uh, I think that, uh, I think I see one very important role of, of the branches these days. Um, I guess there is still a quite big number of people who are not... Uh, used to use digital tools. And uh, I, guess, I guess it's very important to educate such people. And the branches can do that. And uh, instead of doing some services, which can be easily done in, in the mobile application, they can teach this kind of people how to use this tool. And uh, from one point of view, it uh, will be very good support to that people. From another point of view, uh, this is a one more step to digital dig digitalization of the of the context of the environment. In the future, I don't know. I uh, from for me personally, I don't need that. I don't know why. What is what can be the reason why I sh I, I I go to the branch? Maybe some complicated service. I don't know. I mean, when was the last time you went to the branch? I don't know. Uh, I guess uh, half a year on by or one year ago. I do not do that. Why? Uh, because it is very. Uh, why, why did you go there? Why did you go? I don't, I, I needed to close the account. I wanted to stop um, a cooperation with the bank and I needed to close the account. So it was, it was manual process. I had to go to the bank about it. Got it. Rickard, what about you? What is your thoughts, thoughts about uh, branches? Well, I would say that in Sweden, there are still a lot of branches are already gone but still there are plenty of branches around. And uh, this, um, like making payments, uh, taking out cash and so on, that has, um, uh, that is almost non-existent. And uh, that was phased out, say, almost 20 years ago. And, uh, but still, it's, it's as, uh, if you have some more complicated business to do. And uh, the last time I went to a branch was when um, my uh, kids were to get bank accounts because then you have to show up in person, show who you are, show, show your ID and so on. And uh, but before that, maybe it was four or five years ago, but I went, went to a branch. But we say that if you are a company and want to discuss a loan, maybe you would you like to meet people in person for example, so branches are still around, uh, although uh, they don't do the same kind of business that they did uh, 20 years ago. So, I mean, as an economist, I mean, the market will tell if, the, if it's a future for branches or not. Got it. Uh, Ricard, uh, if at some point Google or Amazon become fully fledged banks. Will you bank with such companies? Will you switch from banking? Will you welcome them to Swedish Bankers Association? Uh, yeah, of course, if they become a bank, uh, of course. I have prepared some slides on uh, big, big tech, if you want me to share yeah, them, if this is confused about that. I will give you the past slides. That's, that's interesting. 
you know, please go ahead. Uh, I think there have been a lot of discussions about uh, can big tech take over the the market for banks and so on. And uh, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. Oh, sorry, sorry, just a second. We can see your slide. Yeah, it's just a, uh, yeah, and, no, sorry, just a, just a, just a sh short second here. Uh-huh. Mm. Now, do you see, yeah, let me see now. Oh, sorry, escape, escape, and zoom. Okay, and now I will try again. Uh, oh. So now I think you see uh, the market capitalization for uh, for the, some big firms: Apple, Facebook, Nordea, and J.P. Morgan. And the market capitalization—that is how much the how much the company is worth. And then you can see that Apple uh, is worth over 1,000 billion US dollars. Facebook is worth over 600. Then we have Nordea as the third company. That is the biggest bank active in Sweden. Uh, and they have uh, market capitalization just 27 billion US dollars. So it's, you can see it's very much smaller than the big uh, tech companies. And finally, you have JP Morgan. That is the most highly valued bank in the world. And uh, it's almost $300 billion worth. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's big. Of course, it's very big. But it's much smaller in market value than these uh, tech, big tech firms. So you could say, OK, if this, these big tech firms want to win to banking, maybe they could really outcompete the banks. But if you look more into, and you can also see if the profits are big, but then it, they can become kind of a more of a same size. But if you look at the shareholders' equity, that is the money that uh, is in the company. Uh, so say if you have a bank and you get uh, loads a lot of money, then you have to have a lot of equity to take care of those losses. So this is the thing that I talked about in the beginning of this seminar, that you have to have a lot of money in a bank in order to make it safe so it can withstand tough times and so on. And then you can see total asset. And this is how much assets do you have? And you can see that JP Morgan has uh, almost 10 times as much assets. And that is mostly uh, that they uh, give out loans than Apple. So going into the banking industry, it would really require a lot of money lot of equity, but also you also really have to get all the, get into this industry. And if you compare the total size of the banking market with the uh, big techs, the FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, then you can see that uh, the banks hold uh, uh, three and a half trillion dollars, and the big tech holds only 0.5. I mean, it's of course a lot of money, but still. And if you take the total assets, this is only 30 biggest banks in the world. So if you would add all other banks, uh, it, you would get a higher number. But you can see that this is a huge market. So of course, Apple and uh, Google and so on, they can uh, of course, start a bank if they want to, and nothing wrong with that. And, uh, but if they do that, they really have to uh, get a lot, to invest lots of money, really lots of money. And uh, competition in banking is quite intensive. It's not an industry where you get a high uh, return on investments. You need, you, maybe you make a big profit, but you have to have a really huge capital in order to be a bank. So you don't get as many percentages. And uh, so, so I think um, that maybe they could, but I don't think that they would like to go into 
banking big time because it's not the kind of industry where you can get very high profits. You can't be a monopoly in the sense, say, I mean, there are hundreds uh, or in thousands of rather big banks in the world. And that makes sense given all these different uh, regulations and so on in different countries. And yeah, for some reason, it seems a uh, lot of banks, there are room for a lot of banks in the market, but they're not room for uh, 100 Facebooks in the market. It would make no sense to have 100 social media platforms. So I think uh, it's a totally different kind of uh, market. And they could do it technologically, but uh, they don't, we probably will not do it because uh, they wouldn't make so much money of it. And it would require a huge amount of money. What do you think about demand? Would be there a demand? For example, if you talk personally about you, would you like? Yeah. What what perhaps do you don't like about current banks? What they could improve if they were compared against digitally native companies like Google, etc. Well, I think that one thing is uh, you have these bank secrecy laws. That I mean a lot of the money that Facebook and Google makes. It is because they have this information about their users. And if you are a bank, you are not allowed to use that information. I cannot go to, if, if I see that uh, you buy a Mercedes car, I can't go to uh, BMW and say, you know, this guy, he usually buys Mercedes. So if you want that guy to buy a BMW, maybe you would have to give uh, that guy a discount uh, of something like that. But bank are not allowed to do that and uh, so I don't see that fit into their business model and um, and if they get a lot of customers who would like to use their bank accounts then they, what will we do with the money they will have to lend it on because have get a lot of money in bank accounts without lending it out it's make no sense you have to lend it to someone and then you have to uh, do all of this uh, credit scoring and so on. And you really have to invest a lot of, uh, I mean, it's possible, but it's, uh, it's like uh, a car company going into mining or something. It's possible. And there might be some uh, synergies, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe as technology providers, they may do something. Yeah. But not as banks, not core banking. Got it. Thanks, Ricard. What about you, Hanna? Would you bank with Google or Apple or Amazon? Me personally, definitely, yes. <laughs> I guess. Why? What do you hate about modern banks? Which, which... <laughs> no, it's, um, uh, it's very important that they care a lot uh, and know a lot uh, actually about the, the clients and the service uh, they provide can be poor online and very um, fast and efficient. Uh, I don't know if uh, they can be the bank, uh, maybe there can be some partnerships, uh, but to build inside, let's say inside the Facebook, some uh, uh, financial services, for me, that sounds it's like something which work definitely, which will work definitely. I mean, from the client perspective, client will use that. Yeah, they will use everything that is, that is easy and fun to use. Uh, so I, from the client perspective, I really believe that it can be the, the very successful case from the compliance stuff and all other things which is related uh, with being the bank. Of course, that is a big challenge for them. Uh, and we'll see. Got it. Thanks. And we can but speak a little bit about COVID-19 pandemic. How do you think it will influence digital transformation, banking, I wouldn't say economy, because we will talk till the morning on economy. Let's focus on banking. Any positives, negatives? What do you think, Ricard? Well, uh, uh, I thought a bit about this and uh, banks are actually one of the few 
industries that hasn't been uh, affected that much about by COVID-19 because um, people really want to lend money now and so on. So it's not, uh, so, so we don't have this kind of problem that our market disappears. Uh, the big thing has been now maybe that uh, all the banks has been working a lot from home using Zoom and uh, other apps to have meetings and so on. And thinking about this, I thought that my companies like uh, uh, Sigma that as I understand it do outsourcing from uh, banks and other companies. I mean, it will be much feel much more natural for many more people to uh, co-work over the internet in a way that uh, they were not used to. So I think maybe it's very good news for uh, a company like Sigma that uh, you can uh, you can communi communicate with digitally uh, very easy, but uh, in person it may be hard to go to Ukraine for meetings all the time. But so maybe I see some uh, possibilities for uh, service providers in other countries, for example. Thanks, Ricard. What about you, Hannah? Uh, so I guess it's uh, how it depends on the that starting point I mentioned in the in uh, on the slides. The COVID uh, stuff is uh, actually push a lot that all that digital stuff, and uh, I believe that that banks who had uh, who did some job before and uh, uh, did some exercises about digital transformation and prepare themselves more or less for, for the new reality. Uh, they will uh, survive and actually uh, that one who really digital, uh, truly digital can have an opportunity in, in this environment, in new environment. That one who have lots of extra kilograms and uh, nowadays they uh, need to run marathon with this uh, digitalization. It can be very dangerous uh, for them and, you know, uh, hard, uh, heart attack or some problems with the health can appear. I, again, I use the, the metaphor about the sport, but still uh, it works very good in this situation. So, um, I believe uh, that more healthy from digital perspective, uh, the bank was before the, this new reality chance to survive and to succeed uh, with uh, all these uh, changes, changes that uh, are happening. Yeah, thanks. I will also share my experience recently in the course of last month, I think three companies from Europe reached out to ask uh, to us uh, asking if, if we could help them with technology necessary to compete against Revolut in Europe. So totally nobody is talking about branches anymore and everybody is just thinking digital. Uh, let's wrap up here. Uh, so uh, I, I invite speakers to share the closing remarks, maybe wishes, comments to the audience, as well as the um, audience can uh, send the last questions for me to pick up. Uh, Hannah, will you go first, please? Uh, yes, yes. It, first of all, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, discussion and good, uh, interesting experience for me. Uh, I can tell you that digital transformation is something very difficult, but very, very interesting. When you live in this kind of, when you are the part of such changes, it uh, educates you a lot and gives you uh, lots of new knowledges and um, uh, you can be really proud if you succeed at the end. So um, I wish everyone um, who participate today uh, be enough, uh, uh, be ready for such changes and definitely participate if you have such a chance. Uh, if you are ready to be a leader of such uh, changes is, uh, believe me, it's a very interesting uh, stuff, so do that. 
And uh, thank you again. I wish you luck in all that uh, huge uh, changes, uh, which uh, definitely will happen with, uh, with all of us. Thank you, Hannah. Ricard, the closing remarks, wishes. Well, uh, first I would like to thank for all the questions. I think it was very good questions and uh, that it was, yeah, we had uh, some discussion and uh, would also like to thank Sergey for uh, uh, managing the discussion in such a good and nice way. Thank you. And thank you, Hanna. And um, I don't have any other th remarks. So over to you, Sergey. <laughs> uh, thank you, Hanna. Thank you, Ricard. So let's stay in touch on LinkedIn. Uh, this webinar happened to, thanks to the main organizers, uh, Sigma Software and partners, Corizoid, Datrix, Sigma Software Labs. And uh, thank you our media partners, Nordic Ragtag and Swedish Bankers Associations. Thanks to our speakers and participants. Uh, we will share the video records via your email. And uh, watch our next Sigma Software webinar in June. Follow Sigma Software pages on LinkedIn and Twitter, and let's stay tuned. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.